and I asked Matt to take some of his programming chops and knowledge of network automation and apply it to this problem. How do I automate the rollout of firewall policy changes while guaranteeing that the policy changes are going to meet business objectives? And so Matt is going to take us through a presentation of addressing that challenge. Um, I guess, Matt, what did you do? You cobbled together a bunch of your existing presentations and thought and then turned it into this presentation for today, right? Yeah, yeah. Basically, like what one thing I really like doing in my presentations is giving the folks something to take home. Um, and so everything that I'm about to talk about is in a GitHub repo. You can download it. You can clone it. Um, there's a readme that walks you through every single step that I'm going to do. Um, I'll obviously speak to the different steps and sort of why I think they're important because there's a little bit that the scripts don't tell you, which is like, like how this fits into a design and, and like how it actually tackles the problems we're trying to solve. But yes, largely, I mean, basically what I've done here is um, thrown together some some basic tooling to sort of illustrate just how not scary it is to sort of cobble together a solution out of open source tooling. Well, go for it, my friend, and uh, we'll, we'll be harassing you with questions as you go along. Yeah, please do. I I I, I doubt that I uh, I will. I'll, I'm sure I'm sure I'm capable of blabbing on for an hour, but uh, I'll I'll withhold I'll withhold myself as much as possible. So if you have questions, please interrupt me. Cool. So uh, I assume everybody can hear me and see my screen at this point, right, Ethan? Yep. We're looking at your blue, uh, white on blue title screen, and uh, and we can hear you. If your mic was a little closer, that'd be fine, but we can hear you. Hello. Hello. Oh. Right. <laughs> yeah, I can hear Greg's voice being like, Matt, bury your face in it. Come on. <laughs> yeah, that's it. Dulcet tones, Matt. Dulcet Every tones. podcast I've been on, he's like, no, you got to get closer. And I'm like, all right. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Cool. So yeah. So um, like like I said, uh, like Ethan said, uh, my name is Matt Oswalt. Uh, I've done a bit of uh, everything in my career at this point. I've done a little bit of consulting, a little bit of um, uh, you know sort of customer side network engineering as well as customer side software development. Um, I recently went uh, over to the vendor side. Previously, uh, I was working on the Stackstorm open source project. Um, and actually, the, the the role before that I had at eBay, I was working with a lot of open source software as well. So I've been doing a lot of open source for the past few years. Um, obviously, my background in networking has caused me to sort of uh, root around for use cases within that domain, um, as it's very important to me. Uh, and making sure that sort of like we're, we're we have, you know, folks have a path forward in, in terms of evolving their skill sets. I strongly believe that um, you don't have to be a software developer to be able to augment your skills. Um, with uh, just a little bit of code, a little bit of uh, Python knowledge. There's a huge difference between those two. And my goal for the past few years, and, and the part of what this presentation is doing, is to sort of demystify that and show just how not scary it is. So um, we're, for this particular uh, presentation, the problem statement, uh, as Ethan alluded to, um, and, I, and I'll sort of very, very uh, briefly summarize, is that firewall configuration kind of sucks. Um, We've all been there. I know, uh, especially um, with my consulting background, I've been in many environments where firewall configurations, um, at best, uh, kind of work. Uh, they're usually extremely uh, unwieldy, a lot of statements and policies in there that just simply don't apply anymore. Um, no real visibility into how well uh, our traffic is being uh, passed through the firewall. There's not a lot of not a lot of visibility there. Um, and so with uh, with with some really basic, uh, understanding of some open source tools and libraries um, and and a weekend really uh, or or if you don't want to work on the weekend that's perfectly fine you can uh, do this at work as well um, but I built it over uh, over a weekend um, you can build some really basic uh, software for replicating the same workflow that you would use as a human being uh, just happens to be in Python so the particular problem statement of of just trying to make sure that our firewall configurations are sort of up to date and and then um, uh, making sure that we know that they're up to date. So the sort of a two-pronged approach, it's actually making the change and then actually verifying that change. That's sort of what we're going to tackle today. Now, if we step back and sort of talk like what it would what would be required to do this manually, it's it's not easy, right? We would have to, um, you know, first off, have a good, pretty good understanding of like all of our applications that we need to have allowed through the firewall, what kind of policies they need. Um, and I'm even really, for the time being, just talking about what ports are allowed. This doesn't even get into anything application level. Um, certainly doesn't get into anything more advanced in terms of actually handling the traffic in a certain way uh, or any any advanced uh, you know, stitching between uh, VNS, things like that. Like All of that's well outside the scope of this, but I constrained it to that small problem just to illustrate how easy it is to add a little bit of code to your workflow. So when, when I talk about continuous deployment and testing for networks, what I'm really talking about is this cycle of um, instead of you as a human being sort of being the central like glue of the whole system, you're actually just putting in place 
basic software tooling for uh, that, that that replicates that same logic. It's not necessarily you know like a magical software thing. Software is going to solve all, all, of our, all of our problems because at the end of the day, software is just human logic. That's something that a, a machine can recognize and, and execute. And so this cycle uh, is is formed once you once you've realized that uh, of gathering intent. So sort of what is it that my my policies, firewall or otherwise, what is what does my network need to do? Um, what is the intent of the outside entities, the things that are relying on the network? Um, and in my opinion, this is pretty much uh, the, the the root of truth here is your applications. Um, you really can't generate effective policies on your network without a deep understanding of what applications are going to use the network. Now, again, typically this is done in meeting rooms. What I'm suggesting is this can be very easily done, um, or at least the the intro to it. I don't want to, you know, sort of uh, uh, underestimate the amount of work that's required, but um, it's not a it's not a sort of unattainable beast. Uh, a lot of this can be done via APIs instead of all done through meeting rooms, and it can be done incrementally as well. Um, from that intent, we can apply policies. We can actually use templates and and things like that to just say, okay, cool. Like I I see that these are the three applications that are needed. Um, obviously, a very small network if that's the case, but still, um, we can apply policy from that, and then we can verify. This this is the part that really uh, gets me excited. Um, we can verify those policies are in place through other uh, other tools or or even the same tools. There are there are some cases where um, the same tool can be used for both applying that policy and verifying that that policy actually does what we think it does. So in terms of like why we actually care about testing and verification, I like this tweet. Um, when you're thinking about monitoring, start with the question, how do I know that the system is working? Um, it's really important to think about this because as network engineers, and, I, and I'm guilty of this as well, you know, we, we, we tend to sort of live in our own little world and, and just think, um, you know, the system is working if we, if we as network engineers and the primitives and the, and the metrics that are important to us uh, are within norms. Um, but the network doesn't exist to, to exist, it exists to pass applications. And so that source of truth, that sort of uh, litmus test for us has to be application centric. That doesn't mean we can't augment it with other things that are more relevant to us as network engineers, but that starting point has to be something that's very closely related to why the network exists in the first place, and that's applications. So uh, to sort of um, promote this, uh, I've talked for quite some time about the sort of concept of a networking continuous integration pipeline. Now, uh, if you're not familiar with continuous integration, um, this pipeline is, is is specific to the sort of a networking implementation, but it's pretty similar to what you might uh, see in like a software development shop. Um, the, the main components are uh, peer review. So you've got a sort of a version control system, probably something like Git, uh, reviewing uh, things like you know, source code, Python, Go, C, whatever. Um, uh, as it comes in, and so a human being looks at the code, the the changes that you, that a software developer makes to the to the code base, um, gives a yay or nay, and and it moves on. Assuming it moves on, it'll go down to uh, to do automated testing, and these could be simple sanity checks like linting. You could also do uh, more advanced tests like you know uh, running actual unit tests on the on the code. You can do integration testing, so testing how software interacts with other software. And then uh, this isn't always uh, uh, a part of this because it's considered uh, more of a uh, continuous deployment kind of thing. Uh, or continuous delivery, you can also perform automated deployment as part of this. So um, maybe changing the changing the use case to more of a, a networking centric use case, we actually don't change that much. It's still really important to have peer review. Um, I would still recommend that we sort of move to like an infrastructure as code um, kind of model. For the specific problem statement we're tackling today, it's especially important because whether or not that source of truth is a human being, meaning I know that I need to add a policy to the firewall, um, or it's a, an external software system, for instance, Kubernetes, I can tie into the Kubernetes API and see exactly what applications are there. It doesn't really matter where that source of truth comes from. The changes to the system should be peer reviewed. Um, and similarly, every change, regardless of input, should be automated, automatically tested. And this uh, pipeline sort of forces that to happen. Note that this is a pretty different model from what we're used to the, uh, today, right? We're, we're, we're very, very used to um, effectively skipping to the end of the book uh, with respect to network changes. Um, I always talk about, you know, the way that we make changes on the network these days is very similar to like if you're running, let's say, you know, uh, you know, Facebook engineers are making changes to the website by literally logging in. And this is a really bad analogy because there's not like a Facebook server, but let's say there's a Facebook server and they like log into that server and they change the, you know, the, the, the actual application code live on the system. Um, obviously, they don't, they don't do that and there's good reasons for that. So. Um, uh, we sort of need to get past this model of networking uh, in network configuration um, of just simply sort of changing things live in production. We need to sort of build this pipeline so that we don't have to, you know, worry about the impact or at least not worry as much about the impact of our changes. Now, nothing's perfect. Um, and the whole point of this is that uh, automation is, is um, 
is something you iterate on. It's not a night and day difference. This pipeline doesn't protect you from errors, but it, what it does is it produces a structure where you can learn from failure um, and commit the, the sort of the, the protection against that particular failure into the pipeline itself through testing. That's the, that's the important part. It's about continuous learning is really what we're talking about here. Cool. So just to wrap this up, like I said, the input can be can be human beings. So you might say, okay, I, I want to define all my applications in a flat YAML file. It's perfectly fine. Um, it's a really good way to get started, actually. Um, so you say, like, I know that I need to run Office 365 traffic. Here are all the parameters of that traffic, like, you know, what ports it uses, what kind of, uh, you know, maybe, maybe uh, throughput constraints that you might want to put on it, things like that. Um, all of that can be done as code, and I think you should do that. Um, uh, define as much as you can. Um, in a sort of a flat text file format, YAML is perfectly fine for that. Put it in your version control system um, and then use it for all of your automated tests. Um, that's that's perfectly fine. Um, alternatively, and not, not even alternatively, but but actually uh, separately, you can do both. Um, you, can, you can also retrieve input from external systems. And so you might not want to update YAML files. You might just want to go to an external system, tie into its API and retrieve some piece of data live and use that to inform your policies. Um, such as Kubernetes. Uh, Kubernetes is, uh, for those that aren't, aren't familiar, it's a sort of a next generation application uh, delivery platform. Um, so a way of uh, deploying um, applications via containers to, uh, you know, sort of a, a distributed, distributed systems approach kind of thing. Um, but the cool thing about Kubernetes is that it has an API we can tie into to retrieve all kinds of useful information. Again, that, that keeps us from having to go into a meeting room and, and actually talk to people because, you know, talking to people is kind of boring. Uh, as we all know. Uh, regardless of the source of input, um, you should have your tests ready. Um, like I said, you, you you really should have a set of tests, and we'll talk about the different types of tests, because I think there's a few different types. Um, these tests should be ready regardless of where you get your source of truth from. Um, I do think, and this is the third point, I do think the, the, the sort of the configuration, uh, the, the policy changes you make, as well as the tests, they should be informed by that same source of truth. Um, again, uh, the applications are pretty much the best source of truth. You're gonna have it's gonna all come back to the applications anyway. You might say like, well, you know, I have my my uh, you know my my CMDB is a is a source of truth, uh, so I'm gonna use that, and that's perfectly fine. But but just keep in mind your CMDB is informed by something as well. And and usually if you follow that down the path, some meeting somewhere with an application developer is gonna be the route from that. Some application developer asked for something, uh, you know, a couple months back, and, and that's where all of that data came from originally. So we could start sort of looking at interacting with those teams programmatically via APIs. Um, if you're not ready for that, you could you can always just sort of define things in a flat file and just iterate from there. Again, don't try to boil the ocean. It's all good. None of it's none of it's sort of mandatory. It kind of just depends on where you are. All right. So Matt, b before you before you go on, so just to yeah. just to encapsulate this, you've outlined this this term continuous integration. That's a developer terminology. It's a way that they're doing uh, the testing of changes and rolling those changes into their code and deploying that into an app in, yeah. in a more or less a steady state. You know, continuous yes. integration. Yeah. So we're taking that mindset, that methodology, applying it then to infrastructure. In our case, a firewall and a firewall policy. So, mm -hmm. you, so what we've got so far in your presentation is kind of the background. Here's the thinking process. Here's yep. the, the workflow of how this is going to go. And uh, now, now we're getting into more specifics. Yes. Got it. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And to your point, um, the 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 like software developers want to make changes to their code, right? Um, and and what you, what you could do is say, okay, I'm going to fix this bug or add this feature. Um, so I'm just going to write the code and make it happen, right? Well, how do you know it actually like solved the problem first off? And more importantly, how do you know it didn't break something else? Um, the reason software developers are able to do it now, now normally you would say, okay, well, I don't know that. I have to do all kinds of like, I just, I got to play with the software after I make the change and make sure everything's still working. Um, we call it like manual testing. You know, it's, it's also called QA, although QA has changed a lot in the past few years. Um, and that kind of works, but it mostly doesn't because there's there's no perfect. Uh, if if the humans doing the testing, they're they're going to do they're going to do it differently every time. The the benefit of continuous integration is we've defined our tests in an automated way, and so I can make changes to the code base literally any time, because the code uh, that the changes that I've made won't be integrated with the code base until all of the tests pass. Those tests are a, way, a sort of a safety net. If those tests pass reasonably, I can expect that I didn't break anything and that the feature that I'm building is is going to satisfy the requirements. The same is true for uh, or or if I, it passes all my tests and something still goes wrong, I need better tests or I need additional tests. Yeah, exactly right, exactly right, and that does happen. Um, but again, the cool thing about this pipeline is um, 
it, when that does happen, it sort of provides a structure for you to add those tests or change your tests to make sure it's not caught um, uh, caught again. The whole the whole this is the thing you know everybody sort of like sort of poo poos on the whole idea of like you know fail fast because they hear the hyperscalers talking about. It. I know it sounds silly. Nobody really likes failure. Um, I, I, the hyperscalers don't like failure either. They don't they don't want to be down any more than than anybody else. Um, but they're they put in structure a sort of pipeline for them to learn from failures and so they never experience the same failure twice and that's the whole point of this um you will you will encounter failure things will break but the point is to fix forward uh, the the pipeline provides you sort of a, a way of doing that um, as opposed to ripping everything out and calling it calling it a day so hopefully that puts a little structure around it and yeah i think the same benefits that software developers have realized with continuous integration can be realized on the networking side definitely Cool. Very good. So um, I, I break this. Uh, there's sort of in my mind when it comes to, and this is more specific to networking, right? These are these are the different types of tests that we can run on our network infrastructure to verify that the changes we've made um, are are not a, a not breaking something and and b performing what we need them to perform. Um, we've got config centric, uh, so more of a sort of like a like you know testing the different semantics of the configuration that's on that's on a device. Moving up the stack a little bit, we're talking about network state. These are things like you know BGP neighbor relationships, things like that. And then third, we got application tests. Um, so actually uh, running tests using real traffic um, and 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 validating that that traffic performed the way that we thought it would. And I'll I'll dive into each one of these as we go. Uh, before I do, um, I have a little demo, and this is again all of this is in the GitHub repo. I'll link to it at the end. Um, we've got a, a simple VM that I spun up via a Vagrant. Uh, we've got a VSRX firewall in the middle. This is where we're going to actually apply our policy and then, of course, validate that the policy works. Um, and then I have a, a Kubernetes instance on the right. You don't have to know too much about that. Just keep in mind that's where our applications live. We're going to be querying uh, Kubernetes API uh, to retrieve like what services are running there. There's a simple web app that's running there, um, and I'll sort of step by how step through how that actually worked. Um, but just keep that in mind. That's the whole. That's the whole sort of like the the destination. We're we're not only retrieving information from Kubernetes to see what applications are running there. We're also using that as sort of the target of our tests, um, as well as the VS, VSRX. Like I said, when I when we do the uh, when we do the config and the operational state tests, we're obviously going to be looking at the VSRX for that stuff. Cool. Uh, so before uh, I move on to the next slide and talk about the specific types of tests, uh, I'm going to go over to my CLI here. Uh, and again, everything is in the README. Literally every single step that I'm running, I'm, I'm just copying from my README off screen. So you can do this yourself uh, at home. But read me in, in your GitHub repo. Yes, yes, yeah. yes. And there will be a link. It's literally in the repo. I'll, I'll put a link to the, to the GitHub repo right at the end of my slide deck. So uh, the 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 I'll uh, I'll sort of run this first and just sort of explain what's happening. Um, this particular command uh, performs our sort of config uh, checks. It checks to see if our config is the way that it needs to be. Now I haven't pushed any of the policies that I need to push, and so all three of these checks are going to fail. Um, so that checks the config. This particular script checks the uh, operational state. Now, um, for reasons that I'll get into, this is actually going to pass because it actually doesn't test uh, what I what I want to test, um, and there's there's a really good reason for that. But just keep that in mind; that's going to pass. Um, and then uh, I won't run the third one because that takes a while. But there's a there's a separate test that runs traffic, uh, but that that will fail as well. You'll just have to take my word for it. This is a little magical. Give us a little more context here. So you're running a Python script that's validating that a config exists. That what are we yes. actually testing here? Yeah, yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna get into that now. Like the whole point of this is just to show that I'm running these and the and there's a failure. I'm actually gonna go into each one in detail uh, now. Got I just it. wanted to show that that it's failing now before I actually make a change. Yep. So we're gonna we're gonna cover literally everything I just showed you in in, more, in much more detail. All right. So first thing I want to dive into is this. This particular command that I have here is a script called firewall uh, config firewall.py. Um, what I'm doing is I'm saying, hey, I want you to push policies to my VSRX. Um, that represent what my applications need. Well, how do I know what my applications need? Let's take a look. We've got a little Python script here. This is not a big script. It's less than 50 lines. So um, you can you can pretty pretty simply see uh, what's involved uh, with with uh, with with this script. A um, lot of setup. So we're connecting to you know this is you know gathering uh, gathering arguments that we're passing via the command line. Um, this is setting up uh, our connection to our VSRX device. And then we're actually making the changes. Now, for those that aren't aware, um, we're making these changes with the Napalm library. Napalm is a really cool Python library for 
uh, being able to work with uh, vendor devices and push configs and get operational state and things like that in a multi-vendor fashion. Um, and so the only indication that you that this is a Junos device is actually right here. Everything else is very multi-vendor. Um, so for instance, uh, down here, you'll see I do con uh, commit config. Um, that, that's the same command uh, regardless of the underlying device. Um, so that part shouldn't matter. The benefit to us is that we can write this code once and regardless of what device we're, we're targeting, um, it, it won't have to change dramatically. Um, this is in contrast to like if you wanted to use an Arista device, you'd have to use the Py, uh, the the, Py, uh, the EOS. I can't remember what they call it, but there's a Python library for working with EOS devices, and and similarly, there's some for Cisco and and so on and so forth. The benefit of Napalm is that we don't have to worry about any of that. We just use the one library um, and then indicate what the downstream device is, and then call it done. Now, the sort of magic sauce in this script. This is pretty simple, right? If you've used Napalm, this is really simple, and even if you haven't, it you can kind of guess it to what as to what uh, what's going on here. Um, the one magical spot is this particular function call right here, get K8S services. Um, I have a sort of a separate file here where, again, pretty simply, I use the Kubernetes library for retrieving the services. Now, just to break down the terminology, Kubernetes services are just applications. That's all they are. Um, what I'm doing is I'm saying, hey, Kubernetes, I know you, got, I know you have applications running on you. Um, can you just give me a list of them and what kind of detail, what kind of network details they're using? For instance, what do they call? And then what ports do they require? What ports are they actually listening on? Because I'm gonna use that to inform the way that I build my firewall policies. Now, you've noticed in my previous uh, script, we've got 50 lines here, and we've got less than 20 lines here. Um, and in a, you know, a total of less than 70 lines of code, we have a, a, a way of not only retrieving detailed information about the applications that are running in our environment, but we have the ability to place policies on our firewall that perfectly match what those applications require. Um, the only other part that you haven't seen yet is this particular uh, template here, policies.xml, and this is really familiar for those that uh, understand Junos. Um, this is just a big old firewall policy. It's a Jinja, it's a Jinja template, so whenever we pass uh, the data that we get from Kubernetes into this template, it's going to uh, you know, sort of render this out, and all of the actual policies that need to be applied are going to be, are, are going to be rendered out in this text uh, and then placed on the firewall. And I'll show you the result of this, actually. I can just run this now, so, and I'll show you the firewall. So Kubernetes, we're going to query that. It's going to tell us applications that are running. Because yep. we now know what applications are running, we can infer, all right, based on these apps, I need to set the firewall policy to X to, uh, to support those applications that are running. You've exactly got a right. template that's there. So we can take the data from Kubernetes, map it into the template, and then build out a uh, firewall policy? That's exactly right. Yeah, okay. it, it, in contrast to, you know, the the sort of the long <laughs> drawn out meetings that I, I personally have been in and I hear a lot of people talking about them and a lot of network engineers, they've had this experience where they sit down with application folks and they try to tease out sort of what details the application needs, like just simple stuff, like what port is the application listening on? Usually the developers are like, I don't know, it, it's, it's stuff, you know? Um, and, and, th and that's sort of fine, actually, because they're not supposed to care about that stuff. Um, the, the benefit to this new sort of cloud native world is that everything is API accessible. Um, so really, it doesn't take that much work. You don't have to be a, a developer to be aware of how to programmatically you know, reach out to Kubernetes and get these, to get these, these details um, in an automated fashion rather than scheduling meetings and, and trying to sort of speak the same lingo. Um, just level your skills up a little bit and learn a bit of, a, a bit of Python, skip that whole thing altogether. And it's faster. Now, the, going back to the source of truth problem, some people listen to this going, I don't run Kubernetes. I'll probably never run Kubernetes. Well, that's fine. This whole framework still works. You just don't mm -hmm. query Kubernetes. There's some other data repository. Maybe you have to build it yourself, but there's some other thing that you're querying that you can use. So, so two things. Um, I would be very careful saying we don't run Kubernetes. <laughs> uh, a, lot of, a lot of businesses don't know they're running Kubernetes, but they are. Um, Shadow IT is super, super prevalent. Um, if you have any in-house uh, software folks, it, it's a pretty pretty likely possibility that at least in, in sort of a development deployment kind of thing, um, there is some Kubernetes or containers in, in, in general. Um, and so it, it does, it, I mean, it, it's, sort of, um, it's sort of important to sort of reach out and ask those questions. Now, to your point, it doesn't matter. Um, it could be Kubernetes, could be OpenStack, could be vSphere, could be anything, literally anything uh, in terms of what your source of truth is. These days, it's probably API accessible. Might require a little more work because the API for Kubernetes is pretty pretty nicely defined and there's a lot of tooling for that. 
Um, you know, for your sort of internal systems, it's you know maybe a little more difficult. So it's kind of uh, depends on what you have internally in terms of application deployment. Um, but yeah, I mean, the, the whole point it is just an example. This isn't to say that you have to have Kubernetes to do this. You certainly do not. Yeah. Um, it's just a it's just an example of here's something that you can use to just simply augment your existing uh, workflow instead of actually you know going through meetings and trying to struggle through the verbal communication part. So we run the script, and again, it's going to retrieve the the services from Kubernetes, and it's going to place the policies on the firewall. And uh, I'll just navigate over to the VSRX once that finishes. Perfect. So we're on the VSRX now. I've I've went I've gone over a tab. We'll do a show. Uh, you know what I think? Actually, yeah, it's timed out. Let me spin up a new tab real quick. Uh, uh, let me make this a little bigger. There we go. Good. Uh, and we will run um, Vagrant SSH VSRX01. Clear that. All right, cool. So CLI show configuration. So I'm going to scroll down to the policy section, and you can see that we have two policies, well, three, but two, two policies for allowing traffic. And you can see they're named according to the services that are there. Um, and actually, I can go back to this tab and, and show uh, kubectl get services. This is a Kubernetes command. Uh, sorry, get service. Um, this is a Kubernetes command for retrieving the services. This is the CLI version of this of the thing that we retrieved via API. So the front end service is what we're after. Um, and actually, there's a Kubernetes service for the for the uh, um, for the for the dashboard as well. So we'll just use both. But you can see in the CLI, we can see exactly what ports they're listening on. Everything that we need to know from a network perspective, or at least for this example. Um, is available to us via API. So you can see that the policies that were put in place by my script uh, are it, it, they exactly match that uh, that that data. So we say I know that I have an application called uh, K8S Kubernetes Dashboard and K8S Frontend. Um, so it's allowing those applications. Then we have those application definitions further down in the config where we map the application name, which is referred up uh, in the policy, to a destination port. I didn't type any of this, um, and I don't even care what particular destination port is used because I retrieved it programmatically. And that's the point. Now, Matt, do you have a comment on using, uh, like you're, you're demoing with Python here, um, yeah. but what about using an Ansible playbook instead and using accessing Napalm that way to generate yeah. all of this? Yeah, 100%, very possible. Um, when it comes to these conversations, I have a pretty simple approach. Um, and I know it's a very consulting answer, but it really does depend. Um, I cannot I cannot advise you on whether or not Python is better for you, or if Chef is better for you, or if Ansible is better for you. Um, the only person that can answer those questions is you, um, and the only way that you can do that is by experimentation and actually trying them. Um, I've had many conversations where folks come up to me and they ask which tool is best, and the answer is none of them. Um, all of the tools that you're going to see here, as well as uh, uh, every tool you're going to hear, uh, whether open source or not, was built within certain constraints. Um, and what you need, what the, the journey for you is figuring out what those constraints are and if they match uh, to what you're trying to achieve. I choose Python because I'm a, I'm a sort of a you know, developer kind of person. Um, that works for me. It might not work for you, and that's perfectly fine. Um, but uh, again, this is an example, and it's something, that, uh, something to sort of, uh, uh, the, the concepts behind what I'm showing, I think, are the more important thing rather than the specific tools. So if you have experience with Ansible, um, certainly I know there's Napalm modules for Ansible um, that you'd like to use instead of, instead of uh, building everything in Python. Go for it. There's a source of truth question here. Um, you know, if Kubernetes is running apps that are accessible only internally, in other words, mm -hmm. maybe you don't need to run a firewall, write a firewall policy for them. How how can you differentiate? Uh, sorry, differentiate how? I think between apps that maybe need firewall policy written and apps that do not, because they're only running in a particular zone where there's not uh, a firewall concern. Oh, cool. Yeah, good question. Um, yeah, so Kubernetes has this concept of labels, and you can label uh, pretty much anything that you have in there. Um, so this might be a simple conversation with your developers that say, hey, um, what applications need outside uh, access and what don't? And um, you could just tell them, uh, hey, you know, if you have a, an application that needs, that needs to cross the firewall, label it with this. Just It's like literally a string. It's like a little piece of text you put on, on, uh, on one of your application definitions. Um, and again, all of that's API accessible. And so when you write your scripts or your Ansible playbooks, you can interpret those and say, oh, this label, uh, it, this, this, this label says it, sh it should have ac outside access. And so I, so I should um, make sure that that has the, the appropriate firewall policies. So labels are a really good way of, of sort of breaking down that communication barrier. 
And then a question about uh, documentation. How do we document this workflow after the automa uh, the automation is done? So we've all got it through it. Is there a you know, process you recommend for documentation? Yeah, well, I mean, I, I struggle with this. I mean, I think I, I'm a huge fan of good docs, but the reality is, um, you know, the, 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 the most up-to-date documentation is the actual workflow itself. Um, so it kind of just depends on what your, uh, what, you know, what kind of, um, you know, processes you put in place. Uh, if you've if you managed all of your automation sort of as software developers uh, uh, manage their code, so like version control, automated tests, which I highly recommend you do, um, this becomes a little easier because then you can say uh, for every change that you make to sort of your quote uh, code base, you could mandate that the documentation is kept kept up to date. Um, again, that's kind of hard just because you know people find a way around that. Not everybody's good about that, but um, in terms of in terms of actually you know writing out documentation in terms of like Visios or uh, you know, whatever. Uh, it's kind of, kind of, kind of up to you, to be honest. Um, but uh, you know, one thing that can help. Is, one thing is that it can fair help, to say self-documentation is more the, like within your Python script, keep it documented, use variable names that make sense in your the the code that you yeah. check in. You've got proper commenting and all that stuff. Is that really more what you're getting at, as opposed to, you know, post something on your internal blog or your wiki? Well, I'm I, like I said, I'm, I'm a strong believer in good docs. I think you should invest in good docs regardless. But to your point, yes, I mean the 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 really the only way of knowing that you're consistently up to date, especially if you're trying to make changes very frequently, is making is putting putting in place automation that sort of is self-documenting as much as possible. You really should do both. Um, so yes, to your point, application or, or variable names that sort of are self-describing. A lot of comments in your scripts and your Ansible playbooks. Everything has a comment sort of functionality you can use. Um, don't put everything in one big script, you know, chunk it up so it's sort of logically makes sense. Um, there's a bunch of resources you can use uh, if you're writing Go, Python, whatever, for how to like properly lay out projects so that they're sort of intuitive and in where to find things. Definitely invest in that um, because I think that'll go a long way. Um, but yeah, I, I think sort of from a documentation perspective, you gotta, you gotta do both. You gotta have that high level view so, so people that aren't familiar with any of it don't have to read through lines of code to even get a basic understanding of your system, but also, um, keep in mind that those external docs are probably going to get outdated quickly. So you should put into place processes for making sure they, they stay updated. Okay. Okay. I think that's all of our questions now. Apologies if I missed something, somebody, but uh, yeah, go yeah, on cool. ahead, Matt. Cool. So we've made a, let me, let me, let me take a step back to my slide deck and, and we'll actually run through the test. So we've made the changes. So now let's verify that those changes actually do what we want. First step. Uh, config testing. Uh, it's important that we we focus on this because obviously we're all network engineers and this is something that's important to us. Um, testing our config is is a pretty network engineering specific kind of thing, right? Uh, applications folks don't really care about what configs on a switch. They don't really even know what that means. Um, so this is definitely something that's uh, specific to network engineering workflows, um, but it's just as important, right? This is the sort of the the lingua franca lingua franca of of what networking is, and so we need to make sure we we cover it. Um, now there's there's a few things we can do here and 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 uh, what, one one thing uh, people do when they sort of start getting involved with network automation is do basic what I call Wisby versus Weary configurations. I I, I believe this term's sort sort of fairly well known, but I I heard it for the first time like two or three years ago. Um, so what it should be and what it really is. What I'm doing here is I'm saying I have a golden config, um, and and I'm going to compare that with the actual config on the device and do basically a whole a wholesale diff, right? Um, that's a really easy way of saying, you know, whether or not our our configuration has drifted from our from our intended target. Now, a lot of people have already done this uh, prior to automation, just by simply having golden configs stashed somewhere. Um, but the cool thing about uh, be, being able to generate configs via templates is that golden config can change as well. So you you might say your golden config is actually your source of truth, whether it's the Kubernetes API or the you know a YAML file, whatever that is. And then the actual network device config is rendered from that. And then you can compare that to the running config. Um, that's definitely a step in the right direction, but it's still it's still a, a, a it's like it's like killing a, a fly with a rocket launcher. It's a little overkill, right? It's, it's a good idea, but it's it's a little overkill. It doesn't really drill into the details of what we're actually after. Um, what I'm going to be demonstrating today is being able to run targeted tests rather um, rather than comparing a, a config versus another config, um, which you can definitely do. Um, I'm going to be using a tool called JSnappy to focus in on particular parts of the configuration. Um, and so I know that I need to run 
a certain I need I, I know that I need to have a, a, a two applications defined in my Junos device. I know that those applications need to be referred to in my policies. I know those policies need to be applied on an interface. I know all of these things about my config, how it should be. So let's write specific tests for all of that. Now, um, I, what I want to do is leave, uh, the, again, everything is just examples. I don't want to sort of make this about any one specific tool because it's not. The whole point is the concept behind these tools. And so I'll use one just to, to drive home the example, but just keep in mind there's a different there's different ways of doing everything that I'm about to show you. Um, for doing config testing, I, I recently started at Juniper, and so I just got spun up with this cool tool called JSnappy. It is Juniper specific. Um, I'm going to be showing a lot of other Junip uh, non-Juniper stuff as well. Um, JSnappy is really cool because it allows you to drill into specific um, like sort of segments of your configuration um, and, and be able to run assertions based on that. Now, a prior version of this demo, which you can see, if you go to the README, um, I gave a, a version of this demo which didn't use that. I actually just used a Python script with the unit test library. Or to be honest, I, I'm sort of second guessing that. I think I just used basic Python assertions. But either way, what I'm doing is I'm retrieving the config and I'm saying, okay, I expect this stanza to be here. Is it? Yes, no, maybe, so, that kind of thing. Um, there's also been some presentations. I know Pete Lumbus of Cumulus has done a lot of work on this. I think I sat in a presentation for him uh, uh, at Interop 2016, I think, where he did this, where he showed um, behave unit testing for configurations on uh, Cumulus devices, which is which is pretty cool. Behave is a, uh, a Python-based uh, behavioral testing sort of platform, so you don't have to write Python. It's basically a way of describing, uh, you know, the the end the end state that you expect, and it sort of just says yes or no. So there's more tools than this, but here's these are a few examples for you to get started. So I have uh, uh, the scripts that I ran before, which I sort of passed over. Um, let me actually go back to my terminal here and go to this tab. Uh, if you remember when I when I started this demo, I just ran, I ran a bunch of uh, con uh, commands um, and didn't really talk about them. I'm going to run them again and now talk about them. So I'm going to actually clear this so it's easier to see. I'll paste the the, the script here. Um, this looks scary, but really all I'm doing is just some sort of bash foo to, to save us some time. Um, the script verification demo.py, um, I'm passing in the port that the VSRX is listening on. So this is just a nice big way of passing in the SSH port. And then what IP address our Kubernetes instance is listening on. So really don't worry about that stuff. This is just a way for me to run, pass that information into this script. The important thing is we're running the verification demo script and we're passing in this parameter uh, config, which says, I want to do config testing. Now, before I run it, I'll just show you the script real quick. This is a little more complicated than the script I showed previously, but um, if you look at uh, the script in my GitHub repo, you can see it's uh, sectioned off into different functions. This function, config verification, steps us through everything that we need to do to perform config verification with our JSnappy uh, library. What I'm doing is I'm passing in uh, a few, uh, you can see this is YAML, right? Um, this is a test that describes the, uh, the, the, the interaction with the device that we want to take place. So I'm getting the config. Uh, via the RPC git config, um, and then I'm uh, looking at a particular portion of the configuration. So you remember on our VSRX device, we have um, an application definition, for instance, and I believe that's what I'm looking at here. Yeah. So you can see we have an applications uh, stanza. This is true on any VSRX, um, and you can see we have two applications defined, application K8S front end and then application K8S Kubernetes dashboard. What I'm doing in this test is I'm saying, hey, I expect that at that location, um, applications, application, and then a, a subnote of that, K8S, and then this little, this little uh, percentage S substitutes in the actual service name. And again, what that represents is uh, when I render this out, it'll say front end, right? And so what I'm saying, I expect applications, application, K8S front end to be there in the config. And then uh, uh, subsequently, not only do I expect it to be there, but I expect that the destination port is what I expect as well. Now, the really cool thing about this function, you can see that I don't have the application name or the port that that application is listening on anywhere in this in this in this uh, in this variable. Um, the reason for that is I'm passing it in live. Um, if you look at the the further uh, uh, further up in the script, I'm passing in a services parameter. Now, the, the services parameter is going to contain everything that we use to generate the config uh, in our config firewall script. It's going to contain all of the Kubernetes services that we used to inform our policies before. Um, and so in, when, when we run this, um, this variable is going to get filled out with all of that information. 
um, this this little uh, variable here is going to get filled out with the actual service name and this variable here is going to get filled out with the actual port that that application requires all of that's going to get generated um, on the file system so let me run this real quick and I'll show you exactly how that works So it's retrieving the services from Kubernetes and now it's running the JSNappy tests. Now I'll return to this, don't worry about that. I'll return to this so we can explain what happened there. Before I do, I'm gonna show you the files that actually got generated because I write those to the file system. Um, the way JSNappy works is you have to have a, a list of devices that you wanna test against. And we just have our one, our Vagrant um, VSRX that we have running. And then the testing files, which again, these were generated um, automatically via our script. We have one test file per application that's running, our front end application and our dashboard application. Each one of those also has a file. So we got our front end, this is our test. We expect that the application KAS front end is defined and that it's running on port 30622. Similarly, our dashboard is running and it's uh, running on port uh, 30,000. And uh, as you can see in our VSRX config, that's true. Um, we can see just by, with our eyeballs that that's true, but we don't wanna just rely on our eyeballs, we wanna rely on JSNappy. So let's go over back to the tab where I ran the script. You can see the JSNappy output it's retrieving the config via RPC and it's running our explicit tests. Yes, the applications are defined and the destination port is equal to what we expect it to be equal to. So rather than define all this stuff in advance, we just retrieve it programmatically, um, exactly the same way that we retrieved the, the, the information to generate policies. We're using that same source of truth to run tests that verify those policies actually took place. Okay, a couple of questions here that are come up. One is uh, sort of sort of off to the side here, but someone wants to know: Is that GBT that you're using for your shell prompt? Very fancy. Ah, no, um, this is ZSH. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, yeah, ZSH with a powerline uh, theme. Um, if you want to if you want to set it up easily, I'd recommend Oh My ZSH. There's other there's other tools out there, but Oh My ZSH is usually is pretty much the best. Actually, I think I'm using um. Oh, I don't remember. Anyway. Yeah, CSH. <laughs> Look what you made me do, man. <laughs> <laughs> another another question here about uh, managing variables. Uh, so let me let me set this up. It's a little bit long. My experience so far with programmatic generation of scripts, configs, etc., has led me to the importance of uh, organizing configuration variables in a way that they can be documented and retrieved across multiple changes or projects. Here's a question. Any thoughts on how to store template or uh, program variables centrally so that they can be utilized across multiple programming tools instead of being embedded in a single Ansible playbook or Python script? Oh yeah, definitely. Um, so so yeah, there's there's sort of like three components when you're talking about um, like network automation, sort of infrastructure as code stuff. There's three types of things that you'd want to store. So before I talk about those three things, um, I would recommend everything goes into a repo, some sort of a Git repo. They can be separate repos if you want, but but as, if you're getting started, I would recommend just a single repo to keep things simple. Um, the reason for that, of course, is is all of the benefits of infrastructure as code. You can review changes, you can run tests on any change, all of that stuff stored centrally. Um, now, to your point, um, it, it it can get kind of un, uh, unwieldy if you start mixing data with scripts, with templates, and things like that. So just recognize that you're going to have three different types of quote code. Now, this doesn't necessarily have to mean code. This could be playbooks. Could be Excel files for all I care. Uh, there's three different things that you need to worry about. You need to worry about your data. So the actual data, and I'm not talking about like the actual configs. Like when you're looking at a say a you know a BGP statement, um, router BGP AS number, um, router BGP those two words. That's pretty much going to be the same regardless, right? Um, uh, maybe some differences syntax wise if you're on Junos that kind of thing. But but largely that's just syntax. And so those things can be abstracted into a template. Things that are pretty much going to be the same regardless of what parameters you pass in, that's going to be the same. So that's that's templates. The data that you pass in, for instance, what AS number you want to instantiate, that's that's sort of your data. That's the stuff that goes in sort of fill in the blank kind of stuff. Um, you want to keep those logically separate. You don't want to mix that stuff in with your scripts and your templates. You want to keep it separate. So it's so so when you make a change, you're making it just in that one place. And then uh, the third place is any sort of um, like algorithm, algorithmic sort of mechanisms that you use to apply those things. Now, this may not be the case. You might not have these. Um, I'm talking about things like scripts for actually pushing changes. You might outsource that to like an Ansible or something like that, in which case you don't really need to worry about it because Ansible's code base is sort of separate. It's installed on your system and you're not actually storing that in your repo. Um, or you may have scripts that you want to store in your repo as well. Either way, all three of those three things should be logically separate from each other because you don't want to mix the t you don't want to mix them together, in, in, in my opinion. 
Sally forth, good man. Sweet. So I, I have 10 minutes left. Um, I would really like to get to sort of the third stage, but the second stage is important too. Um, what's, what's good is the second stage is sort of in progress and I'll explain why that's the case. Um, I mentioned before, um, uh, let, let, me, let me go back. This, the second sort of type of testing is, is state testing. Now this is close to the real world, but it's still a network engineering sort of centric kind of idea. Um, I really mostly, uh, uh, what I'm talking about here are things that you can't necessarily infer from the config you know that there are BGP peers configured, but you don't necessarily know from the config or you don't know from the config whether or not those peers are actually live um, or whether or not routes are being learned from those peers, things like that. That's what I'm talking about when I talk about operational state. Um, now, the cool thing about uh, the state testing is it's a little more real world, but again, it's still a network engineering centric kind of thing. Um, now for this, there's a, a variety of ways you can, you can run tests against the network state. You can either go get it, talking like SNMP or running scripts to say, I want to query this RPC for data. Um, or you can stream telemetry to an outside source and then perform assertions on the telemetry that's coming in. So I expect that the, the interface statistics that I'm seeing all the time will never exceed some sort of a predefined threshold. Um, kind of doesn't really matter what you go with. It just kind of depends on what, you, what you're after, what, what kind of information you're after. Now, in terms of tools that are usable here, um, JSNAPI actually has a play here. JSNAPI is actually uh, using just RPCs. So again, it's Juniper specific, but it doesn't just do configs. You can do operational state too. Anything you have access to via an RPC in Junos, you can use JSNAPI to test for. But I already showed JSNAPI and this, this presentation is not about any one specific tool. So I'll talk about Napalm. Um, I, I used Napalm already to generate configs, but you can actually use Napalm to verify operational state as well. So if you look at my uh, uh, verification demo, you can see that I have a, another function for doing that verification, um, where I where again I, I, I set up the the connection to the device, and then I uh, generate a a verification file. Now, um, there, uh, for for reasons that are sort of more Napalm specific, I'm not going to be able to do anything that's that's really relevant to the firewall use case. Um, the reason for that is the verify functionality is based off of the getters that are that are uh, provided by the Napalm library. For instance, um, if I want to verify the BGP neighbors that are actually connected, I can use the get BGP neighbors function in Napalm and then run assertions based on that. Um, there is a get firewall policies function, but unfortunately uh, today that's not implemented for Junos. Um, if it was, I'd be able to do this. So for now, I'm just doing basic ping checks. Um, I'll move on to the third style of testing just because there's not really much useful to talk about here, but just keep in mind this is this is a very new feature um, and you should definitely keep track of the Napalm Verify functionality because in terms of verifying operational state, you're likely not going to be able to find a better open source tool because of the way Napalm is built um, to, to handle those getters. Anything that's Napalm accessible, uh, can be can, uh, you can run verifications on that. So moving on, and this is sort of the important thing from my perspective. Again, the source of truth for us, and, and maybe it's not the immediate source of truth. You might, you know, you might have like a sort of a, a network specific source of truth, but that's that that sort of the you know CMDB or whatever you have set up, or, or maybe YAML files, that still needs to be informed by something. The very root source of truth at the end of the day is going to be your applications, whether you retrieve it programmatically or in a conference room. And so we should have tests to validate that. We should have tests. Um, that actually use application level semantics and, and, and traffic even um, for, for knowing whether or not the applications we expect to be able to run over our network have the ability to do that. So um, I have a third command uh, that, I, that I can run here and I'll just uh, substitute, sorry, I'm going to minimize the go to webinar thing. Uh, I'll take out config and I'll type in traffic. This is the third, sort of the third style of, of running tests. Um, and actually, I wanted to show the next slide. There's a, a bunch of tools that you can use here. Um, I wrote an open source project called Todd. What this is a, basically an agent-based approach for, um, you can deploy agents throughout your infrastructure, typically on servers. Um, you know, probably co-resident with the applications would be would be good. So like you, let's say you have OpenStack or Kubernetes deployed, you deploy Todd agents to, to where those applications are. That way that they have the perspective they need. Um, similarly, you can use Thousand Eyes. Um, there are obviously free tiers for Thousand Eyes. Um, uh, but uh, for the use case I have in mind, obviously I want it all to be automated and the API for Thousand Eyes isn't available in the free tier, at least last time I checked. Um, hopefully that's, that's still accurate, apologies if it's not. Um, but uh, the API is only accessible uh, with a paid subscription, so just keep that in mind. Um, there's a few other tools, JMeter, it's more, it, it sort of has root, uh, origins in, in sort of web testing. So I wanna run, uh, I wanna do load testing against a web application. Now they've evolved since then, it's an Apache project, they've evolved greatly since then to do much more than that. 
Um, so I don't want to discredit that, but it, it's kind of a, in my opinion, it's a little bit of a, it's a little bit of a bear. Um, uh, you know, it's, it, it is what it is. You, you, you might take a look at it, but it's a little bit, a little bit of, of a, of a sort of a big, big project that might be, might be, uh, it, uh, some work involved with getting used to that. And then perf sonar, I don't know much about this, but I know it's sort of a distributed network testing thing. It's sort of like grid computing. I know that a lot of service providers, um, have nodes around the internet for doing performance testing. Um, so very, very distributed testing, um, definitely something to look at. So again, not well, about we the did tools. A, we did a show on Perf Sonar a while back. I think Nick Baraglio was on that, and we talked about it. Uh, it's in some length. So that that goes back a ways. But if you uh, search for that on PacketPushers.net in the search bar, I'm sure it'll pop up if you're interested in Perf Sonar. Um, and Matt, another question that's popped up here. Uh, it's, it's actually it's it, it's one of those standard questions that come up with when anytime you're talking about automation. Now the question is, uh, my experience with change verification. Um, the change verification process is that if you're going to write a script to do it, it takes a lot of extra time to write that script and you can just kind of get into the CLI and hammer out show commands after the change and mm -hmm. get the same thing done faster. So yeah. w where do you draw the line where the extra overhead of writing the network verification scripts makes sense? I don't. Um, I don't draw that line. Um, the reason for that is, in, in my mind, automation has never and should never be about saving time. Um, my... my uh, <laughs> Uh, a lot of a lot of folks in the industry probably know Michael Bashong uh, works for Juniper. He's actually my boss. Um, the way he puts it is, uh, if you're looking to save time, take a typing class. <laughs> um, and, and and I I I think there's there's a lot of truth to that. Um, automation it tends to go in that direction a lot where you're trying to save time. Um, and certainly there's there's time to be saved with respect to automation, but that can't be the goal. The goal for automation in my mind has always been about consistency and stability. Um, I'm putting into place uh, uh, I'm putting into place tools and processes around automation to make sure that my network um, doesn't experience the same type of failure more than once. Um, to make sure that my infrastructure broadly uh, doesn't um, experience the same failure more than once. Um, I want to make sure that my network is as closely aligned with other silos and other disciplines as possible um, through APIs and through um, programmatic access rather than in conference rooms. Um, if speed is a byproduct of that, great, but it's not the goal. The goal is consistency. The goal is stability. The goal is going home at 5 p.m. and not getting woken up at 3 a.m. I'm a huge fan of that. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it, it's it's a, it's definitely a, a logical place to go, right? Everybody talks about automation saving time, but but I I I, am, I would encourage people to sort of uh, look beyond that. Um, it's it's about going home at five. All right, fair enough. Uh, another comment that was made: um, someone suggested you could use Ripe Atlas for application testing. They've got an API. And, yeah, good call. Uh, I forgot about that one. Facebook's Net NORAD, another option for active monitoring. Uh, and Matt, you're coming up on like less than two minutes. Did you want to make any final points or something else you wanted to show up before we hit the top of the hour? I mean, yeah, I just was running the script and, and I'll just show it working. Yeah, that's pretty much it. Um, do it. But uh, yeah, I mean, basically, the if you if you look at the every, every, all of my verifications are in here. So just to sort of point you to it again, everything's in the Git, GitHub repo. So traffic verifications there. Um, I make assertions at the end of this to make sure that the HTTP code retrieved from every agent. So it's actually querying the services in, in Kubernetes through the firewall and so if the firewalls wasn't configured correctly this just wouldn't work it wouldn't retrieve any any status code because it would have a connectivity problem so this not only verifies that i can connect to kubernetes but that the policies are the way that they need to be um, and that the application is working too which is which is also important it's not again we want to go beyond just what's important to network engineers we want to try to tackle the whole stack if at all possible um, and you can see it's running it's running a test for the second service but you can see the first service succeeded um, I, I got an HTTP code uh, 200 against this. So, um, yeah, so just to wrap up, uh, yeah, I'm going to move on to the questions. Any, more, any other questions we need? And then here's the link to the GitHub repo. Um, literally every command I just ran is in the readme. Highly recommend that you clone the repo. Check it out. Um, if you have any questions, file an issue there. I won't bite. Um, and, uh, yeah, thanks for, thanks for listening. Okay, Matt, and uh, how can people... You know, aside from your GitHub repo, is there other, uh, you know, your your blog, Twitter, anything you want to talk about? You got a book? Yeah, so I <laughs> I do I do have a book. Um, so I'll leave the, the screen up uh, for a little bit. Um, my my Twitter handle is Mirdin M I E R D I N, uh, and then my blog is keepingitclassless.net, uh, and then um, 
Oh, it looks like my webcam is still showing, which is good. Um, I do have shameless plug. So sorry about this, but plug it. I have, to, yeah. I have this, I have this book here that's written by uh, two, two really smart guys and me. Um, and I, I recommend that you, uh, that you check it out. This thing is huge, dude. I didn't know it was going to be this big. I've been looking at an ASCII doc text file for like you know, four years. Like that's craziness. But anyway, it's out now. It's on Amazon. I, I believe it's still like 50% off or something like that. So the time is now. Move on it. Thank <laughs> you.